Unity's early beginnings are steeped in both the Old and New Testament. It seems that the Bible has become, for some, a book to avoid. However, when we take a look at its sacred text from a metaphysical perspective, its rich history and a deeper meaning begin to unfold. They say there is nothing new under the sun, and this is true about the Bible. Every story that's in it, oh yeah, every story that's in it is a story of consciousness playing out to the human experience, and the lessons of yesterday are still applicable. <laughs> applicable. Yeah, yeah, today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The Bible comes alive with stories of love, hope, redemption, and victory. <laughs> thank you. All right, I want to thank Nathan and Leilani from our youth for participating today. And uh, what they said is very true today. And first of all, let me start by thanking Ralph and the Board of Trustees for inviting me to speak here. And to share with you today, I really appreciate your kindness, your generosity. Thank you. And once I got the call, suddenly something happened. There was this feeling that I had. I call it fear. I call it sometimes being frightened. But what it didn't feel like was peace. And so... I said to myself, what can I do? Where can I go? What advice can I get that will help me through this anxiety that I feel about this giant talk that I wish to give and that I've been asked to give? And I didn't have to look any further than my handy-dandy Bible and also to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And whenever, I noticed with this story, first of all, that I was opened up immediately to the life of this 17-year-old shepherd boy who had a lot of responsibility and who had a lot of courage. And I started to see that there was about six different things that somebody must do, must follow in order to be successful in overcoming anything. Me, mine is overcoming a little bit of stage fright. But there could be health illnesses or desiring a different job or position. Whatever your giant looks like, uh, 1 Samuel, David, inside of it, shows us perfectly how to do this. And the first thing that he was doing in order to prepare for his good, because he's about to embark on a quest, a life quest. He didn't realize, but he was about to receive some glory. He was about to receive his good and to become elevated in his life. But it didn't first look like that, but he had to prepare. And the way he prepared without even realizing it was that he was responsible. The first thing, being responsible. He was a harp player for King Saul. King Saul suffered from what we would know, uh, call nowadays depression. And so whenever Saul would go there and play the harp for him, his spirits would lift, he would feel better. He did a good job, David did. He did his job well. Second of all, he had responsibilities at home with his dad's sheep, his dad Jesse. David did his job well then too. And later on, I will tell you exactly how he did his job well when it came to being just a regular shepherd boy. This takes me into these things that we must do. If we're talking or looking at a new job, a new relationship, more money, whatever it is, in order to be raised in consciousness, in order to be elevated, we have to do what we are currently tasked to do. What we are called to do, we have to do that well, above reproach, in order to go on to the next level. If you desire a promotion, doesn't matter. Doing what you do now is paramount. The second thing that I found, and before I even say the words, so the first one was that David was responsible. He had a job and then he had responsibilities at home. The second thing was that he was obedient. 
Now, I know a lot of Unity folks and a lot of other uh, people don't like the word obedience, but I understand it to mean something more, something greater than what the physical body, the mind, the intellect wants to say is a power struggle between me and somebody else. Obedience is obedience to what God is doing through you. It's the, the intuition that you receive. When you're in prayer and meditation, things that you hear to guide you on your daily path to success, guide you to what is yours to do. David was obedient. With obedience, sometimes our good comes in small packages. We're about to read that his father, Jesse, was about to ask a very small favor of David, and yet it would probably be the biggest yes that he could have possibly said in his life. In verses 17 and 18, his father says, take, for, or take now for your brothers uh, of this dried grain and ten loaves and run this to your brother's camp. He also gave him cheese to bring to the captain, the captain um, of the thousands. And um, what he said was, give this to your brothers, give this to the captain, and let me know exactly what's going on on the front line. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. Now notice I didn't say something. I omitted something because the Bible actually omitted it. Now I know if this was 2016 and we had David, the 17-year-old boy, I asked him to do something, I'm probably going to get a why me? Can't somebody else do it? Isn't there somebody else out there? The typical response with a teenager. But if you notice, David didn't say anything. He went to bed, he got up in the morning, and went straight away doing what was his to do. He didn't ask why Bob in accounting, for those of you that work in various places, he didn't ask why Bob in accounting, why can't Bob do it? Why can't Sheila in uh, human resources, can't she take care of it? I'm not trained, I'm not qualified. You didn't hear David say that. Oftentimes to get out of a task, I remember in the military, we used to say it's not my job description. I don't think uh, a harp player and a shepherd boy, the job description is to also go off into war and find out how people are doing and deliver them food. But yet David did not give that excuse. He wasn't offered any type of wages to go out there and to find out how his brothers were doing and to drop off supplies. He just said yes to his destiny. He gave no excuses or back talk. But there's one important, or excuse me, two important points I want to make with that. It says he left his sheep with a keeper. Before he went off and did what his father asked him to do, David took his responsibility, because he's a responsible young man, 17 years old, got a job, got chores at home, he knows what he's doing, and he said, I'm going to leave them with a keeper. But there's another thing implied. David had actually prepared himself for success. When you don't prepare for success and those opportunities, you're going to have to say goodbye to them when it comes about. He prepared himself for success because he made those relations with the sheep or the, another person to take care of the sheep. He built those bridges. So if he had to leave at a moment's notice, if your good comes at a moment's mo uh, notice, are you ready to receive it? Are you ready to say, Here's my responsibility. You have now been blessed with it because I've trained you up and I've asked you and we've already coordinated. Now let me go get my good. Really, whenever you looked for some type of elevation in life, make sure you have done the appropriate preparations. So this leads me to my third point. David had courage. So he leaves his father's house, supplies in hand, and then he arrives to the camp where his brothers are, but he's met with a surprise. Under the command of King Saul, he sees that the Israelites are cowering. Generals, captains, sergeants, everyone is in fear. There was a giant on the opposing side, a giant with the Philistines, 
that seem bigger than life. Now we have the Israelites and we have the Philistines on opposing teams, or let's say sides. These two, army, or these two armies represent the thought, the opposing thought and mind of every individual. The Israelites know to strive and to follow the truth, whereas we have the Philistines who are open and violently opposed to anything that is, of, uh, that is like God. In metaphysics, we call this truth and error. So now we have truth versus error. Saul and his men were terrorized by this giant named Goliath. Goliath had taunted them, taunted day in, day out, 40 days. Woke up in the morning, said, hey, send me your best man. Nothing was done. Everybody was scared. At night, went back out there, send me your best man. Nobody came to meet, to confront, to face this Goliath until David arrives on scene. David says and does something that's incredible. He starts to question it. When we start to question our giants in life, when we start to question the big things, he was wondering why nobody was fearless against this Philistine. It was beyond him at this point. And let me paint you a picture of what Goliath looked like just so you have a better idea of what David was facing at this time. As his name suggests, Goliath, he's a big dude. He's, he's not the guy that you're going to see, um, you know, behind a desk. He's one of the guys that you see at the gym who works out constantly, bench presses, does what he has to do to look good. And this is what Goliath was. And in verse 4, it gives a description of him. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And what that is equivalent to is about 10 feet tall. So we have this massive human being who's 10 feet tall, who's taunting the supposed lesser army. And it went on and said he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze everywhere. He was all bronzed out. He was covered from head to toe in protective armor. Altogether, his armor weighed about 126 pounds. He had so much stuff. He was so weighted down that he ha actually had to have somebody hold his shield. Somebody had to go out before him and hold his, sh or hold his shield. And with Goliath, we are often scared, even terrified, at the giant proportions of some error thought represented by Goliath. Our Goliath may be different from that of our neighbor, of our mom, of our dad. Our giants are different than what our neighbors are or what our friends are. So somebody may be facing a giant that looks like finances. Another person may be uh, looking at a giant that looks like health or relationships. It doesn't matter. These giants look bigger than life, and that's what these Goliaths are. And that's what Goliath is representing. And the way that Goliath gets armed is through our fear. We arm Goliath every time we give a lack thought, any attention. As soon as we give into, the mind starts racing if there's a problem in front of us. As soon as we say that I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I can't do it. We are arming our Goliath. We are giving it all the strength and all the power and all the life that it has for us. So what we're being called to do and what David did was he did not give in to the appearance of what Goliath was. He didn't care how big he was, how bad he looked, and how much he taunted anybody else. He was not going to stand for it, and he accepted his destiny. He said, yes, I want to fight. This guy is for me. Where do I sign up? And that's what he did. He made it publicly known that he wanted to take on Goliath, which is great. But why did David offer to go out before the Philistines? David represents love. And love offered to go out and fight fear. 
because that's what the Philistines, all that armor, everything, it's just fear. It's just opposition. Uh, opposition. David had all his faith in the one presence, in the one power, God the good, not God the somewhat good, not God good on Tuesdays, but not Thursdays, but God the good all the time, no matter what, God the good omnipotent. He had tested this already. And we'll go into how he had actually, before he even met Goliath, he was already testing it. He was already, his faith was already strengthened. But David still met with opposition. He says, hey, choose me. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to do this. But he had to overcome rejection. There's a saying, it's often darkest before the dawn. It's often darkest before our hour of glory. It's often darkest before we were about to see a manifestation, before we were about to make a demonstration. Things seem to be at their worst. But this is the point in time when things are the darkest, that's when you must sit still. That's when you do not move. You stand firm. If God sends you somewhere, realize you will be equipped, you will be armed, you will be able to do all those things because God does all things and does them all well. So David realized that the Christ was within him, that he was enough. He was already armed. And I'm taking this from Pastor Stephen Furtick out of Elevation Church, but it's such a powerful, excuse me, powerful affirmation. The Christ is within me. I am enough. Let's, let's try that out. Let's tap ourselves, impress the subconscious, make it sink in. The Christ is within me. I am enough. Now look at your neighbor, just in case your neighbor didn't hear you, but let them know how the Christ is within them. They are enough. The Christ is within you. You are enough. Absolutely. You are strong enough. You are big enough. You have whatever you need in order to face your giants. The Christ is within you. But it didn't matter. His brother rejected him, said, hey, why are you even down here? You need to go. I know you're just trying to boast yourself. You're just causing trouble. What's a little meager boy like you doing in a, a man's land, basically? You're a sheep herder. Where did you, what did you even do with those sheep, basically, is what his brother said to him. But that was okay. He didn't, A, disbelief is okay as well. David kept on. Well, Saul heard about an individual that wanted to fight this Goliath. And so Saul, King Saul, sent for David. And lo and behold, when David shows up at camp, Saul's about to reject him. In verse 33, Saul says, you are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth. You are too young. This man has been fighting since he was young. He's got too much experience. He's got more credentials. He's better look, whatever. <laughs> People will try to tell us, keep us from our good, why we can't do it. But remember, if God sends you, it's already done. It's already complete in the mind of God. The victory has already been won. It doesn't matter what the King Saul's say and the, how big the Goliaths are. It doesn't matter. You are equipped. So David reveals to Saul, hey, I used to keep my dad's sheep. I am strong enough. I had a sheep, basically, uh, um, a bear and a lion come out after my sheep, and I was able to get them, and I was able to defeat that. David had experienced the power of spirit in subduing the lion and the bear. This experience gave him the courage, the fearlessness and boldness that what God has done before, God now will do again for me and more. What God has done in the past is still relevant today. The fifth point I would like to make is David used a different armor. He used his own armor. Saul tried to armor him. So it says in verse 38 through 40, So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. He had not tested this armor before. He wanted to make sure it was good. He could move in it. He could, he could do what he had to do. 
And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. David had to take off this armor that somebody else had given him. Saul had tried to arm him for this battle, but David knew that that was not enough. How many times during a problem you take it to a, a friend or a family member and they arm you with their advice? They try to tell you how it should be done, how they did it like this almost 20 years ago, but, you know, in Canada. This is the thing, is that God will always arm you. When you have truth within you, when you have faith within you, your armor is already there. The Christ is within. So David knew better. He knew he couldn't face Goliath with just anybody's armor. He hadn't tested it, but he had tested God's armor. In actuality, facing Goliath wasn't David's first attempt towards victory. He had already done it. He even gave it in his testimony to Saul, saying, I fight the lion, the bear with the sheep. He already knew God had already proven faithful in that situation. David now, with that faith, knew that he could take on Goliath and win. So Saul blessed him. And David says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw and the lion of the paw of the bear, or paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from this Philistine. He just knew it. That's it. When you know, you know. And number six, David meant business. When you're going about the work of God, you got to mean business. You cannot allow any Goliaths, I don't care how big they are, how tall they are, you can't allow it. So he picked up five smooth stones from the brook. The brook represents the spiritual life in man. The five smooth stones represent the five senses. And Basically, all the roughness has been taken off of those five senses. So David goes off, slingshot in hand, confronts Goliath with one stone of truth right to Goliath's forehead. Goliath goes down. The forehead is the seat of intellectual and sense consciousness. David denied Goliath's power. He denied that Goliath had any power to do him any harm. So this is your call. Stop arming the Goliaths in your life. Rise and stand in truth. Stop telling God about your big problems Start telling your problems about your big God, that the Christ is within me and that I am enough. That there is no giant, there are no credentials, there's no education. My foe cannot have anything against me because God is within me. I go forth with that power. I am armed with that truth. There's nothing out there that you cannot overcome. When you have God, one with God is the majority. One with God is the majority. It is the Christ within that does all the work through you. And we give that acknowledgement to that one source and that one provider, the Christ, the divine within. When you tap into these truths and stand firm on them, all things are working for your good. The harvest will be yours. Your goal, every idea, your victory will come to pass. Thank you.